you get a chance to uh, register for a chance to win a $10 gift card to Starbucks. Remember that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, just as you're coming in, if you could all just register your attendance with the link on the screen here, you'll be entered to win a $10 Starbucks gift card. We'll be starting in a minute or two.
Hey, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, that's good. It's easy. I'm retiring. <laughs> Testing. Okay, this works. Yep. Good afternoon. I think we got this working. So I've been given permission to give you an abbreviated introduction instead of reading all the words on this sheet of paper. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today, Mitch Cohen, who is vice chairman of PwC. And the summary is, has been there for about 35 years, done a bunch of different things, and is involved in a bunch of cool projects, uh, and retiring in about 80 days. Yes. So, uh, and beyond that, he is a Penn State grad, uh, graduating with a degree in accounting and is involved in the Smeal uh, College of Business's advisory board and was named an alumni fellow last year. And we have copies of his book over here, uh, The Self-Made Billionaire Effect. I wanted to stop at The Self-Made Billionaire. I was hoping that was the entire title. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, The Self-Made Billionaire Effect, uh, How Extreme Producers Create Massive Value. And we have some copies if you'd like to come up and, and say hello and get one signed. And with that, I will turn it over to Mitch. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it is great to be here. Um, I was telling some people um, before this that we came out with the book a little over a year ago, and since that time we've had a lot of speaking engagements, um, done a lot of media, and been invited to a lot of universities, and Harvard, and MIT, and Duke, and we've been all over the place. But I just got under the wire before retirement to finally be invited to my alma mater, so I'm just thrilled to, to be here uh, with you. Um, I want to talk about the book, but before I do, I want to give you an abbreviated version, a video for a couple minutes. They'll take you through a bunch of things, and then I'm going to come back and talk a lot about the book, how we started, why we did it, and some things maybe you could take away. So with that, we can run it. Value creation, that's the goal. How to get more of it? That's the question. Ask any business leader and they'll tell you today's environment makes it harder to achieve. But there are people creating massive value, billions in value. There are at least 800 self-made billionaires alive today. That's two-thirds of all billionaires worldwide, and the number is growing. More than 80% of the self-made billionaires we studied made their fortunes in highly competitive markets. How are self-made billionaires different? What are they doing that current and aspiring leaders can learn from? We set out to do the first systematic study of self-made billionaires to try to answer those questions. Think of self-made billionaires as producers, in the Hollywood sense. They envision something new, sell the vision to people who control the resources they need, and forge the parts into something everyone loves. But corporations are set up to reward performers, again in the Hollywood sense. These are people that can execute brilliantly and delight audiences, but they don't create something new. What distinguishes producers from the rest of us? Producers have five distinctive habits of mind that allow them to combine perspectives that most people keep separate or even in opposition to each other. Billion dollar ideas come through empathetic imagination or the marriage of extreme empathy for the customer's needs and wants, and an imaginative mindset that reveals new, untested ideas. As they pursue those ideas, producers accept that timing is not under their control, so they work with patient urgency to prepare themselves and their business for the time when the market is ready for growth. Producers apply inventive execution to design the product, service, business model, or deal structure in a way that unlocks new value and reaches a larger market. In the realm of risk, self-made billionaires are not huge risk takers. Instead, they are able to take a relative view of risk. They are far less concerned about losing what they have than of missing out on a large opportunity. Last, producers approach leadership with a partnership mentality. The archetype of the solo genius is pervasive, yet the reality is that producers run their businesses through a leadership partnership. They find performers, people with complementary skills, to optimize their business potential. 
Corporations cannot succeed without performers, but they also can't create new value on the scale needed without developing and keeping more producers. To find more producers, consider four approaches. First, look for producer talent in the employees you already have and give those nascent producers opportunities to develop their habits of mind. Second, pursue focused recruitment of catalyst hires, identified specifically for their possession and demonstration of the five habits. Third, partner with producer organizations that are pursuing new value in areas that are interesting to you. And last, screen potential acquisitions not only for the products they own and the markets they serve, but the producer talent they possess. Leaders can create huge value in today's changing world. Through the stories of self-made value creators, we'll show how you can develop yourself, your team, and your organization to unlock the self-made billionaire effect. It took me forever to draw all that. It was just a killer. I like to start by talking about why we wrote the book. And um, my co-author is John Sfiokla. John's one of our uh, strategy consultants. He's a Harvard, uh, former Harvard professor. And John came to me one day, and one of the jobs I had in the firm was strategy and thought leadership and brand. And John said, you know, Mitch, as a firm, we talk a lot about value, delivering value to our clients. Our clients talk about delivering value to their customers. Um, value is a part of everything that we do. So why don't we study the people who've created the most value in the world. And I said, who would that be? And he said, self-made billionaires. My initial inclination was that book and that studies probably happened. Um, and what we learned was that while entrepreneurs were studied individually, entrepreneurship was studied, this group as a, as a, as a group itself was not really looked at uh, as a body. So we, we went at it as a team and I should say that while John and I have the privilege of having our names on the front of the book, it was very much a, a team effort. We had a team of researchers, including uh, a few of our managers who spent the better part of two years doing a tremendous amount of work, getting to um, know these people, understanding everything, reading everything about them, uh, at times finding creative ways to get interviews with some of these people, which was uh, one of the challenges as well. Uh, so it's very much a PWC book. Um, we just happen to have our names uh, on the front of it. And for my partner over there, just so you know, the royalties go to the firm, not us as individuals. I just want to be clear on that. Um, so let me go through a little bit of the data. And the data bounces around in terms of billionaires. There's, when we did this a few years ago, there was 1,200. I could tell you that probably went up to 1,500. But a lot of those people trend with the market and oil prices, and it's probably down back about 1,200 right now. But directionally, that's the right number. Of the 1,200, a little over 800 made their money in self-made uh, self billionaires. The others earned their money the old-fashioned way. They inherited it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I'd highly recommend it if you can arrange that. Um, and then what we did was, you know, I have an audit background. And we took very much a, uh, an audit philosophy of how we would sample this population. And we took that 800. We excluded a number of people because they probably earn their money in less than transparent ways. Think of oligarchs, different people around the world who may have not really been in transparent uh, markets that you could really judge. We then left, were left with 600. We took a cross section of those and what we really wanted were different ages and different industries and we studied 120 of them in depth. And I should say I referred to our researchers they, there is a lot written about all of these people. And we went back to when they were um, actually children all the way through. And some of these people were in their 70s and 80s. And some of them are still relatively young. And then we did interviews with 16 of these people. And you'll see it's a, um, an eclectic group. Some people you would recognize, certainly the Mark Cubans of the world that everybody wants to hear about. Uh, up through T. Boone Pickens, and there's real estate people, and Mickey Arison from uh, Carnival uh, Cruise Lines. So a pretty good cross-section. I should say that uh, these people were unbelievably gracious with their time. Uh, the shortest interview we had 
was three and a half hours. Some of these interviews extended over several days, um, and they were very, very uh, understanding and shared a lot of information, more than I ever would have uh, imagined. So um, I'll refer to a few of these people as I go through my talk, but happy to answer any questions you have on them. So the first thing we wanted to do was understand what kind of trends there were in terms of what could we deduce from this population. And what we realized was that there were a number of myths. Um, first one had to do with where they earn their money and that they're in mature markets. And when we do consulting and we talk to companies that are in mature industries, their, their challenge is, gee, I'm in, a, I'm in a mature business. How do I grow that business? Uh, beyond and have outsized returns that some of my competitors may have that are in new businesses. And what we learned was that people found ways to take a mature business and have a different take on it. And I'll refer to a few of those, but, but think of some, the example I, I love to use is Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz did not invent coffee. Um, he found a different way of delivering it and a different experience for people. Um, and time and time again, we saw people who found a different, the Simon brothers found a different way of building houses um, and taking out basements and doing things in a different way and capitalized on opportunities. And, and so it, it doesn't necessarily require you as an entrepreneur to find a new business, but maybe a different way of approaching an existing business. The other thing, and this was an important thing that we've talked to a number of companies about. Um, Two-thirds of these people work for larger companies at some point in time. And <clears throat> the question for uh, big companies is why did those people leave? Why couldn't they retain people who created the greatest value in the world? Um, <clears throat> the first line in our book has to do with Steve Jobs. What would have happened if Steve Jobs had, had stayed at a company called Atari? which some of you may know, some of you may not know. Um, Steve Case, who started AOL, was at Pepsi and Procter and Gamble. Uh, Stephen Ross, who's a real estate tycoon. If you've been to New York, he developed Columbus Circle. Uh, Stephen Ross was a tax manager with us. And um, uh, Phil Knight, who started Nike, was an audit person with us as well. Um, he's done very well for himself. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's really uh, key here is that 25% of these people, one in four, were not only worked for other companies, but were, were fired and had a certain level. Of, some of them fired on multiple occasions. And it got us really thinking while we talked about entrepreneurship and value, what this book really turned into was how companies manage talent and how you're firing people who may be the very best people for developing the greatest ideas uh, in the world. Okay, breakthrough moments. Um, this is a pretty young crowd, except for a few of my friends scattered about here. Um, and there's a perception, if you follow the media, that everybody's you know, 19 in Silicon Valley. They came up with an idea in their garage. They came out, and it's uh, a unicorn now worth a billion dollars, and, uh, uh, and it's great. The data would tell you something different. The data would tell you that breakthroughs come in your 30s, 40s, and even later. There will always be people who come through with ideas at a younger age. But we heard time and time again was people talked about developing a certain level of scar tissue and a certain level of experience <clears throat> in order to, to move ideas along. I don't want to deter anybody here. I hope somebody in this room goes out and comes up with a billion dollar idea and then donates it back to the university at some level. And, uh, but the reality and the data would tell you it takes time. And I'm going to come back to that concept again. The other thing we looked at was the, um, where people came from in terms of their socioeconomic, where they, their, where they were on the strata. And, and there was no really direct correlation. It's great to start out with more money. Um, but there isn't a direct correlation of people with more money come up, have all the, the great ideas. Um, one of the best people we interviewed and had one of the most interesting stories was John Paul DeJoria. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he started Paul Mitchell. People know what Paul Mitchell is? It's a hair, uh, 
shampoo and all sorts of hair products, he also came up with Patron tequila. And, uh, and we write about that. There was a point in his life where he was living literally in his car. So it runs the gamut. If you come from a poor family, you come from a rich family, there's no real correlation. This is always a dangerous one when I'm speaking at any university. Um, now, I don't want anybody running out of the class right now saying, you know, Mitch was here and he said, I don't have to finish school. Um, but there's a, it's an interesting uh, analysis as to the level of schooling that people uh, achieve and whether there's a correlation to uh, creating value. Certainly, there's enough stories out there of people who didn't finish school, and, um, but there's also a lot of stories of people who did. I will say this, though whether people finished school, got advanced degrees or not, everybody we spoke with, everybody, was a lifelong learner and spent time. They were voracious readers, inquisitive, and, and that never stops during their... I hate to burst everybody's bubble about Mark Cuban because I know when you watch his show, he looks like he's sitting there and he makes this snap decision and away we go. Um, He's a, one of the most studious people I've met in a long time, and he's a deep thinker, deep reader, and goes deep in various topics before he'll be investing in certain things. And that was something that was pervasive through everybody that we met with. So let me go back to this concept of producers versus performers. Um, one thing I want to make really clear it's not a bright line that somebody's a performer, somebody's a producer. It's a continuum. And the people we studied, we would put at the far end of that producer spectrum. And there are uber performers um, as well. And if you do go back to the Hollywood uh, analogy and you think of movies that you've seen, and some of you know, if you follow PWC, we count the ballots of the Oscars every year. It's our big thing. Um, if you're an actor, if you're a performer, you can make a lot of money. You could be really famous. Um, it's a trade. You work hard at it. You develop your craft. And you go out and you perform. And you get paid for it. And if you're really successful, you make a lot of money. But you're not going to be a billionaire. It's the Steven Spielbergs of the world, the Lucases of the world, the people like that who have the ability to have that vision to put together all the pieces the screenplay, the writing, the financing, the promotion, the marketing, the branding, the talent, putting that talent together and pulling it all together. And that's a unique skill that very, very few people have. We see the same thing in business time and time again. Now, regardless if you start at PwC or IBM or Exxon, um, when you start at those companies, including ours, Everybody evaluates performance. So what happens? The best performers sort of move up to the next level and then the next level. And what you eventually have in a company are uber performers that are sitting around in the C-suite of companies. Nothing wrong with that. You make a lot of money doing that. But then companies sit back and say, why didn't we come up with this idea? Why didn't we? Because you really weren't looking for those kinds of people. In fact, some of these people were not good performers. I'm not saying that uh, Stephen Ross or Phil Knight weren't good performers at our firm. I, I have no idea whether they were or they weren't. I'm guessing they, they were good performers. But at the same time, that's not what companies look for. And they look for people who are in a, typically in a narrow area and they're working very, very hard and they move to the next level. And it's a real challenge for companies as to how you find those kinds of people, how you retain those people, because it's, it's counterintuitive to say, hey, I'm going to keep somebody. I have 100 people. Here are my best performers. Here's some people in the middle, and here's some people at the bottom. Why would I keep that person at the bottom? Because maybe they have those skills that long-term may be the right kind of skill. Maybe they're in the wrong performance job, if you will. And we've explored this idea with an, a number of companies, including um, we've looked at it internally. And we have a number of different businesses that we're always getting in and out of and starting. So when we interview people, we're starting to look at, 
for those kinds of jobs, we're looking for different skills. And I'll take you through some of the questions. So there are five things, and I just want to delve into them a little bit more. And once I'm done, I just want to open it up for any kind of question that you have. This whole idea of empathetic imagination and having empathy and the imagination to do something about it. Plenty of people see a problem. Some people see a problem and see, have an imagination as to how they'd fix that problem. These people see the problem, have the imagination, and do something about it. You know, when we talk to people about ideas, I'm sure you've all experienced something where you see something new and you say or hear somebody say, I had that idea. I could have been that guy. Well, you weren't uh, because you didn't really do something about it. Let me give you two examples. Anybody familiar with a company called Morningstar? Anybody? Okay. Morningstar collects information about mutual funds and stocks and bonds and started by a guy named Joe Mansueto. Joe's well into his 70s now. Joe, as a young investor, used to get all these prospectuses and would line them up in his dining room table and try and organize them. And one day, he was organizing them. He said, boy, you know, I'll bet there's a business. There's probably other people who are trying to do the exact same thing. And that's how he started the company. And it's a multi-billion dollar organization now. He started with his own problem, had a way to deal, do something, and did something about it. Let me go to the other extreme. And the one when we do media, people always want to ask about. So I'll bring it up, and I'm going to keep it as a PG level. So does everybody know, or do people know Sarah Blakely? Anybody? Nobody? You know Sarah Blakely? Does? What did she start? No. <laughs> she started a company called Spanx. People know what Spanx is? Yeah. Um, so Sarah Blakely had two jobs. She was a fax saleswoman, and you don't see too many fax machines these days, and she was a stand-up comedian. And in both of those jobs, she had one problem that she was trying to fix. She wore pants, and she didn't like her panty lines. So uh, she cut out the bottom of her pantyhose, and she thought that was the solution to her problem. It had the slimming effect, and I don't know all the details of how that works, but evidently it worked for her. Um, she then thought it was an interesting idea and took that around to different companies. Would somebody manufacture things that had a slimming effect on women? She took it to 200 manufacturers, and they all rejected her. Until one, um, one guy went home that night, explained it to his two daughters at dinner, and that's how Spanx was born. Um, they prototyped it. They opened a few stores. They got some sales. Oprah said she really liked it on her show, and it had a slimming effect on Oprah, which was really good, and away she went. But again, in its own way, it's like Joe Mansueto saying, I have a problem, I have a way to fix it, and I'm going to go fix it. Patient urgency was actually, that term was coined by one of our partners, Adam Gutstein, who's a consulting partner with us, and he helped with various aspects of the book. Let me explain what that means. The, the average idea to get to a billion dollars of value takes 10 years. We looked at ideas, all the ideas that created a billion dollars of value from beginning to end on average, they're 10 years. That takes a lot of patience. A lot of patience in terms of individuals who are sticking with something. A lot of patience for companies that would stick with people for 10 years a lot of patience for, for investors to stick with people for 10 years. Um, it's a unique uh, part of this whole story. Um, but that doesn't mean you sit there and you just hope it happens. You have a certain urgency to perfecting your product, to taking it to the next level, to prototyping it, to testing it here, to tweaking it, to maybe ripping it up and starting all over in a different way to continually look for new sources of financing in order to wait, to wait that out. One of the things that investors, especially in Silicon Valley, look at, they're very skeptical when people say a market is going to develop. And we know it's going to develop, and it's going to develop in three years. Well, guess what? We can't always determine when a market is going to develop. But you might have a product or service that you're convinced when that market develops, you will be there and be able to be 
first out of the gate and hit that. And that's what these people do. There are many, many entrepreneurs who have an idea, they take it to a certain level, and as somebody said to me, life gets in the way. Get married, buy a house, have kids, and all of a sudden, you know what? I don't know if I really could hang in there that long. And that's when ideas sort of, these people go all the way um, to the end. And they are two things in conflict. You have the urgency of when am I going to make my money, when's this going to hit, and, but at the same time having the patience to hang in there when it isn't turning into money immediately. <clears throat> the question we get a lot of is this concept of inventive execution. And I go back to the maturity thing that I mentioned and finding a different way to approach a market. I used the Howard Schultz one. Um, he took the concept of coffee and cafes in, in Italy and said, gee, why can't we replicate that in the US and I could charge a lot more for my coffee. How many of you have gone on a cruise at some point in time? Fair amount. You know, when I was a young guy, um, there really wasn't a cruise industry. Um, there were yachts that really rich people went on trips, but there wasn't a cruise industry. And it was Mickey Arison in Carnival who came up with the idea, well, why can't we develop something that the average person going on vacation can afford to experience what people might experience on a yacht? And bigger ships, spread that cost over more people, have different price points in terms of you know, what people, high-end cruises, middle cruises, lower cruises, different food for different people, and make that concept available to millions and millions of people. And now it's a, a huge industry. Um, I'm not going to comment on, I, I've never been on a cruise actually, but, and I know there's the horror stories of things that go wrong, but it is a very, very big business. But he had the foresight to say, boy, there's a bunch of people who'd probably like to do that just like rich people, and was willing to make that kind of investment. Uh, and you can imagine what the investment's like to develop those kinds of ships and keep putting money back into that business to develop more ships, more ships, more passengers uh, to spread that cost. But we get a question about risk a lot from companies. And are these people the uber risk takers? And the quick answer is no. That they see risk the same way most of us would see risk. They see all the things that could go wrong. But as we referred to in the video, the biggest risk that they see is missing out on an opportunity. And that's the greatest risk for them. And they balance those two kinds of things. When we speak to larger companies, this is a concept we've talked a lot about because most big companies can relate to it. When an idea gets thrown on the table, usually sitting around that table, you might have some lawyers and you might have some accountants and you might have some engineers and everybody has a reason why something won't work and it gets killed before it even gets down the road. And balancing that discussion is important for companies if they want to get things out, out of the basement and into the, the limelight. I'll give you the best example right now that's pretty hot and that has to do with electric cars. And even though Tesla had a, a bumpy week, um, Elon Musk was out first with an electric car. Now, the people at Ford, the people at GM, the people at Chrysler in the 60s and 70s, they had an idea for an electric car. And you know what happened. You know how that meeting went and why it wouldn't work and how it upset their whole supply chain. It's completely different, blah, 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 and it got killed. Time and time again, we find companies that had ideas that never got all the way there. Um, before we had iPhones and iPads, we had the I, uh, iPod, which if you think about it, the company that had all the pieces, they had the technology, they, had, they actually had owned the music, was Sony. They had it all in front of them, but they couldn't put it together. And somebody named Steve Jobs said, I'm going to come at it in a very, very different way. And although it was told time and time again it wouldn't work, ultimately 
it took that market. And you know what happened at Sony, they were probably sitting there with, somebody probably had that idea. Could we make it smaller? Can we do it? And it got killed. And finally, producer-performer and that partnership. This doesn't hold in every case, but many, many instances we saw over 60% of those um, billionaires had somebody on the other side who was their performer. Um, you know, Bill Gates had, you know, Steve Ballmer in the later stages of his career. Even Steve Jobs had uh, Wozniak. There were a number of the Simon brothers who were in, in real estate. One was clearly the producer, one was clearly the uh, performer. There are a number of husband and wife teams, and there is no correlation between sex and who was the producer and who was the performer. Um, but there's a number of those teams as well. And one of the things that we saw with these folks was that they were very, very comfortable in their own skin understanding what they're good at and what they're not good at, and what they wanted to partake in and what they didn't. And it's, that's a really hard thing um, because not everybody is as self-aware as a lot of these people and would readily admit that they weren't good at certain things. Skip ahead. I'm going to skip the. So, <clears throat> these are some of the questions, and, and actually, you can go online. We now have an online thing we're piloting in terms of um, do you lean toward being a producer? And, um, you know, have you ever experienced real failure? And it's a question I ask when I've spoken to. Um, C-suite executives, and I've spoken, John and I have spoken to a number of companies, their leadership teams, and <clears throat> it's interesting when you ask that question, they always, oh, well, I, I failed. I said, really? And uh, I'm not talking where you got a C plus when you were in college 30 years ago. I'm talking about, have you gone bankrupt? Have you had a startup go bust? Have you been fired? Have you been, and invariably you look around the table and nobody's had that. They haven't experienced failure, because what's gotten them to this point is not taking a risk that could ultimately result in that kind of failure. Um, what is your track record of bringing ideas? You know, something for everybody in this room. Most of these people did something very early on, high school, college, starting a new organization, starting a small business, doing something on their own to demonstrate that they had that in them. And I'm not deterring anybody here if you haven't done that, but I go back to this point about being very honest with yourself as to whether you are that um, kind of person. Some of the older people in this crowd will, will find this funny, that there was a disproportionate number of these people who had paper routes at some point in their life. And uh, not, there aren't too many paper routes today, but um, that was a common trend. A, dispro a crazy number of people had paper routes. So I'm going to, my wife hates when I put this up. So how can you talk about failure to those young people? Um, we talk about data in our firm a lot. And the data tells you if you've studied entrepreneurship, that, that businesses fail. More businesses fail than succeed by a big number. And I talked about having you know, the guts and the fortitude to get up off the ground and do something um, um, different and maybe go on to that next business. But what you find is that first, the people who do experience that kind of failure learn. And um, I'll go back to my Mark Cuban example, because I know young people love Mark Cuban. We write about something in this book, his first business, Believe it or not, this great business guy, this really uber guy who's come up with all these ideas and has a TV show and he's a billionaire, um, got fleeced by his secretary slash bookkeeper, basically cleared him out. And um, it's sort of embarrassing. But what he learned from that was, you know what, no matter what business I have, I'm going to put in some controls. I need to have people who I could trust. I need to have people checking on those people to do those kinds of things. All those things that are just, you know, um, great things that auditors love to hear. But he learned from that. Um, not in entrepreneurship, but if you watch the Masters this weekend and you watch Jordan Spieth blow the Masters, you'd see that a half hour after that he was ta talking about why he failed and, and what he learned from that. I think the same thing applies. Second thing is an interesting study that was just done. 
on job satisfaction and surveyed all sorts of people. And regardless of whether it's successful or not, entrepreneurs in general have a higher level of satisfaction in what they're doing. It may have something to do with purpose and what they're doing, that they wake up in the morning, they own something, they're doing something with it. Uh, and it almost didn't matter whether it was a successful business or unsuccessful. And the last thing is um, companies at times are looking for people who've experienced that kind of failure. That they're not looking for some, because they realize that to develop a business, you do need a certain level of scar tissue. And if you haven't had some failure along the way, you probably haven't tried hard enough along the way. And so companies at times and headhunters at times actually look for people who started multiple businesses, whether they're successful or not. And large companies are bringing in some of those people. So I'm going to finish here and open up for questions. But I, but I will say that uh, I am going to retire after 35 years in the firm in something like 80 days, the end of June. And I can tell you, in those 35 years, I've worked with all sorts of companies, big companies, the AT&Ts and the Xeroxes and the Comcast. But the people I had the most fun with and the people who I think um, showed me the most guts and the most business savvy were those entrepreneurs who I dealt with during my career. So I, I know many of you are here to learn about entrepreneurship. Some of you want to get on your way, and I just got, I must tell you, it's, uh, it's a great road. If you have the stomach for it, uh, it could be quite rewarding, and uh, I think a great step is spending a day or two at events like this and at my favorite school. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I guess so we'll be opening up the questions now. So uh, whoever asks a question, we'll be getting a book, one of Mitch's books. And uh, Mitch, would you like to just call on people? I'm going to give him mic. OK, right in the front row. So will you start a company now that you're going to be retiring? Are you going to have your aha moment? Excuse me? Are you going to have an aha moment now that Where you're Where I do retiring? something? Yeah. And, um, um, that question's been asked uh, a lot. Would I do something? It's interesting. When you retire from our firm, one of the things that um, people ask you a lot is what, what are you going to do next? And a natural thing would be to go on boards and do that kind of thing. But having done this and during my career, the thing I've had personally the most amount of fun with are entrepreneurs and working uh, with them. Now, I would, I'm realistic enough about myself to say I'm probably not all the way at one end of the performer uh, spectrum, but I know I'm not an Uber producer as well. But there's probably some producers out there who could probably, you know, put a guy like me to work. Who knows? So it's, uh, um, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. All the way up top. It's IST. You have to have more than one mic, right? <laughs> uh, hi, sir. I have a question. Like, uh, I mean, before this book, there are several, maybe several hundred books talks about how to be a millionaire, how to be a billionaire. Like, if you, can you give us some idea of how this book is different from like previous books? It, it's a great, first of all, there's a big difference between, there is a great book on how to become a millionaire called The, the Millionaire Next Door, which was written about 30 years ago. But it's not a how-to book. We were very careful that it was not, you know, if there were clearly steps you can take to become a billionaire, I probably would have taken them, and I probably wouldn't be with you today. Um, what, what this does is it, it, it tells individuals and it tells companies what are indications of people who can come up with those kinds of ideas that can result in billion-dollar ideas. But it's not necessarily, you know, a how-to. It's not a guarantee. You know, one of the things that we saw with so many of these people, and I go back to the imagination point, and to take nothing away from, I'm on the Smeal Board of Visitors, and take nothing away from business schools or any other schools. Many of these people had very, very broad-based education, and they studied things that they really cared about and were passionate about. And this is a great university, 
and I encourage everybody to take some of their time. And listen, my son graduated here a couple years ago, and I was like every other parent. I wanted him to graduate and get a job. And, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot you can learn in areas that you're passionate about, whether it's in art or whether it's in theater or whether it's in famously um, Steve Jobs, who went to a number of uh, schools, says the most valuable course he ever took was calligraphy at San Diego State University, which taught him a lot about shapes and design that affected everything he did with Apple. Um, Chip Wilson is somebody who developed a number of companies in the uh, apparel industry. His mother was really interested in, in sewing. She was a bit of a hippie. And he learned to, and he was about 6'4", 250, and he was a linebacker, but he knew how to sew. And he learned a lot about colors when his mom took him to Afghanistan and Pakistan like 30 years ago. So it's opening your mind up in a way, I know I'm giving you a long-winded answer, to see the opportunity that might exist and to have the imagination to do things like that. So. I don't know if that's what you want. If it was an easy answer, I'd, like I said, I'd, I'd have it. Right there. Hello. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, Hello. Can produ or performers become producers? You know, it's a great question. And it's a question we get asked a lot. Here's the way I'd answer that. Um, I think of it like athletes that you're not going to take the worst athlete in the world and they're going to become an Olympian. But you can move up that continuum. If you're a really good athlete, you can move up and be somewhat successful. And I think part of this is putting yourself in a position to be honest where you are and to be able to move along that continuum. Because it's not a black and white, I'm a performer, I'm a producer. I think the key thing is to identify, especially for companies, to identify, well, who has the potential to be a producer and to give them those kind of opportunities to see what they um, do with that. So I don't, think, I don't think it's the kind of thing that you could take somebody and say, well, I'm going to make you a producer. Um, but you can look for those indications, and you can give yourself a better chance of identifying those people and giving yourself, like what I talked about, and taking courses and traveling and doing those kinds of things to open up your mind to various pieces of imagination that may enable you to do something when you see a problem. The last, right? That's the cheap seats. You said you uh, spoke with Jeffrey Lurie, correct? Yes. Uh, did he tell you when he's going to bring me a Super Bowl? Um, well, uh, <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, Jeffrey Lurie is the uh, owner of the uh, Eagles. He's one of those who started out with a bit of money. Um, I'm a season ticket holder, so I had that same question um, uh, of him. I will tell you, since you brought him up, because people ask about, well, gee, he's got a football team. That's pretty simple. What's the creativity about that? Um, Jeffrey Laurie was in the entertainment industry. He was, in, he was in Los Angeles, and what he was really looking for was uh, discovering hit TV shows. And he realized that sports, and certain sports like football, you actually had a guaranteed audience. And you had, it was, there's no doubt about it, you put a game on, there's going to be tens of millions of people, they're going to watch that game. And he thought football teams were being valued as sports team as opposed to being valued as an, enter, as an entertainment enterprise. And he thought there was a, a mismatch that would eventually catch up. So he bought the Eagles for $181 million. At that time, it was the highest purchase ever for an NFL team. The next day, in the Wall Street Journal, he was ripped as this young kid who overpaid. He bought it from a guy named Norman Brayman, who bought the team about eight years before that at about $60 million. And um, the interesting thing was, a couple of years after that, the NFL signed a contract with Fox. And some of you don't, probably don't even remember when there, there wasn't Sunday night football. There wasn't Thursday night football. So, and what happened was that audience and the value, and that's why those teams are now worth a couple billion dollars. The interesting thing was, while he loves the Eagles, uh, he was looking at it initially as a, from a business standpoint. What he really wanted to do was buy a European soccer team uh, before he bought the Eagles. And he couldn't get the financing 
sport. And the interesting thing is if you follow European soccer, the same thing that happened with the NFL happened with European soccer in terms of the value of those teams skyrocketed with the Premier League and other leagues that you now even see on television in, in, the, in the U.S. So um, that's why, you know, he was looking at a product and saying, gee, it's, misva it's not valued properly, and um, eventually that will turn around and it'll be worth a lot more. Yes, I, I hope, I've been going to Eagle games since I was eight, and I'm 56, and I'm hoping before I die I get one, one Super Bowl. So, <laughs> first row again. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say I had a big failure moment, and which is maybe why I'm not a, a producer. Um, but I would say, and I tell this to, um, I typically speak to our new partners. I could tell you that m most of the failures I have had were where I did things on my own or made a decision on my own where I probably should have spent more time consulting with others uh, before I did that. And what, what I have found and what we always stress in our firm actually is, you know, the, the only bad decision is a decision that you make all by yourself. And when you, we have a big firm, we have lots of partners, and, and I think that was the lesson. So, but as far as a big failure, I've been, um, you know, blessed. So I've, uh, I've had a pretty, pretty good run. But maybe I didn't take enough chances. Go ahead in the middle there. Yep. Got a mic coming your way. Um, so you talked a lot about the skills that are really necessary to be successful in the business realm. Do you think that you can apply them outside of business? It's a great question. Um, I... Um, uh, I'm on the board of a, an organization called Donors Choose, and uh, Donors Choose is, and the PW, my PwC colleagues would know this, they fund, um, it's a mechanism for crowdfunding for teachers um, to fund projects in their schools, typically uh, teachers or school districts that don't have uh, the amount of money. <clears throat> and it was voted one of the most innovative a couple of years ago by Fast Company, one of the most innovative organizations. Not not-for-profits, just organizations full stop. The CEO, Charles Best, um, who was on the Colbert Report a couple weeks ago, by the way, um, <clears throat> taught, when he read the book, he said all those concepts apply to not-for-profits as well. And having the, the imagination of, think about it, <clears throat> the way donors choose works is that um, people can go online and see a project in a school that's of interest to them. And, and they could fund it. Now, when I, when I say a project, it could be a school teacher in Savannah, Georgia, who's trying to teach something and doesn't have the books for it. And that person's maybe from Savannah or has an interest in that and, and, and funds that. And, so he had a, and he created a different experience that you get the satisfaction that, boy, I funded my elementary school that I went to, and I get letters back from the kids thanking me for doing that. And, um, and I think 30 million people at some point have funded things through Donors Choose. So the same concepts uh, apply. I would also say one of the things that we're looking at doing um, is addressing this in the government setting. And if you think of some of the problems that we, we have, across, regardless of your political affiliation, just how things function, whether it's uh, um, transportation systems or the IRS, is there a different way of looking at that through a lens of, you don't hear a lot of people talking about empathy and imagination working in government. And think of the time frame. And that's one of the challenges when we, um, we did talk to some leaders in, in New York City about this. Most people who are in government are thinking in two, four, and six-year cycles. So it's tough to get somebody to say, gee, I'm going to um, you know, wait this out. Great example is the White House recently, last week, just installed um, new phone and email systems. And it um, has nothing to do with Hillary Clinton, but it was, and it was really antiquated. 
And it was, and think about it, you have people who are in there and they're gonna be for four years. This wasn't their highest priority. And, and you probably have better things in your, your dorms and your apartments than the president had in, in his office. So I think those things do apply in a variety of um, realms. That's a great question, thank you. When you studied success and failure, did you also study the personality uh, types and traits of these people? And uh, if so, did you find something that prevailed through them all? You know, we had a, um, we had a lot of discussion about that. And it's tough to, to and there's been some studies done on um, charisma and you know, does that drive value in CEOs? And, uh, and I would say there's really no correlation related to that, that we, that we have seen. There are people who are very, very, you know, I've seen very charismatic CEOs who are not great CEOs. And I've seen very understated individuals who were very, very effective at what they did. And the people we met ran the gamut um, as well. And so I, there, there really isn't. And one of our researchers was, was hell-bent on trying to prove that there was. So we had a lot of dialogue about um, you know, this whole thing about charisma. And some of these people were actually, actually, I would say, quite the opposite. They were more humble, somewhat reserved. Um, I go back to the point of being a learner. They, they really thought a lot about things. Uh, I will tell you one other attribute that we saw that we touch on just briefly in the book that's a lesson for all of us that John and I, after four interviews, picked up on. These were long interviews. These are important people. Um, we cannot think of one example in all of those interviews that they were interrupted, checking their phone, going to answer a phone, asking, them, hey, I need to duck out for 10 minutes. They were always in the moment. And those of you who work in business, you know, we're all multitasking. You're checking your email. You're, people are running in and out. And it was one of the most impressive things that, that we saw with these people, because I know I'm not like that. And I, very few people have that kind of discipline that whatever they're working on at that point in time, that's the only thing that they're going to be focused on. And once they were done with us, they moved on to the uh, next thing. And that takes a, a tremendous amount uh, of discipline. It was one of those things that sort of jumped out at us and, uh, as, as we talked to these folks. Over there. We okay on time? Okay. Uh, so as someone who got to work with a diverse group of businesses uh, that do different things, what's one market you're really excited about in the coming future, in the next like 10 years or so? There are a number, there were I shouldn't say a number. There were three of these people that we talked to, we asked that question about what they're working on and what they think of. You know what the biggest thing that's gonna be scarce in the world is? Water. And people talk about energy and they talk about oil and they talk, but, but, but people are really thinking a lot about food and water and as a growing population and new sources of that. Um, and it's interesting, Steve Case came out with a, a book called The Third Wave, which just hit a few weeks ago, and uh, talks about the initial phase of the internet, the second phase, and the third phase, and which industries would be disrupted. And they were, let me see if I get it right, food, healthcare, transportation, um, and, and you, can't, you can't outrun large demographic shifts. So you have a growing population in the world, you have a finite amount of water and food, you know that's gonna be scarce, that's gonna create some kind of opportunity for people. You have an aging population. Healthcare broadly is a, um, you know, the projections around healthcare, um, <clears throat> there's people who've studied this, I, I, I read recently in in London, I forget what school in London, and they say the first person to live 150 years has been born already. So with healthcare and science and medicine, think of what that does to a variety of things in, in the world. So what we found with a number of these people 
they're thinking those big thoughts about what could be disrupted and how they could play uh, a role in that. Go ahead. To my college self? Uh, it's a great question. And the question was, uh, given all the experiences, what, would I, what advice would I give to my college self? Um, I was that student who wanted to come out, get my degree, and start then with a big eight accounting firm. I was hell-bent on doing that. And I, I probably didn't enjoy it as much and probably didn't explore as many things as um, I should have. Um, it's funny, my, um, my son graduated, you probably know me, five years ago, which we were, <laughs> we were, we were there together, and he, and he came to Penn State, and um, he once heard me say that, and whenever he got in trouble doing something, he said, Dad, I'm out here for the full experience that you told me I should, uh, <laughs> I should, I, I should be getting and uh, that you missed out on, so I'm trying to make up for it. But I, but I really mean that, that there's, um, this university has so much to offer and has a, even a lot more to offer than when I uh, attended and graduated in, in 1981 before most of you were born. And I, I'm not sure everybody maxes out on getting all the opportunities that they could here um, in, in clubs, in the arts, in different kinds of things, uh, in diversity, or you spend, or do people spend enough time with different kinds of people, or do they stay as at the Penn State thing where you stay with your, your little group that was probably a, a microcosm of where you went to high school? And so those are a couple of things that I encourage people to think about. Hello. Okay. It's good. Um, thank you for coming. Um, from your research, would you say there's a correlation between people who initially intended to become a billionaire before they did? We can't find one person who started out saying, you know what, I'm going to make a bill. I'm going this. I'm going to make a billion dollars. That's what I'm going to do. Not one. What we saw was that they saw a problem, and they were certain they had a fix to that problem, and they weren't going to let that go without dealing with it. There's no way Howard Schultz, when he sold that first cup of coffee, said, you know what, this is a billion dollar idea. Um, so I think those people, I think investors, I can tell you, are always very skeptical of people who come in and say, well, I'm going to make a billion dollars. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you all. No, you got to come in with your, your value proposition as to what's the problem, what's your solution, why are you the right person to come up with that solution, what's unique about that, what's the competition going to be, all those kinds of things, as opposed to jumping ahead and saying, and I'm going to make a billion dollars uh, in the end. So we can't find anybody who started out at that point. Obviously, they started things because they thought there was something to be successful with, but at the same time, it was more about solving that, that problem and saying, well, maybe this will be uh, a business. I had a, and you know, they were all gracious with their time. Some were funnier than others. Steve Case, who I don't know if many of you know, started AOL. Um, and I, I grew up working a lot with technology companies and telecom companies. So he started AOL. He was a bit of a rock star. And I enjoyed my discussion at many levels with him. He was a liberal arts student. It was interesting. It's a classic case. His brother who you might have read about at some point, was an investment banker. Um, they're from Hawaii. He went and went to Stanford, went the business route, became a big investment banker. I'd probably put him in the category of a performer, an uber performer. Steve was the, went, lived in Hawaii and went to school in New England at a liberal arts school, poli-sci degree, then gets a job at P&G, then Pepsi, and says, now I'm going to go to a startup. This internet thing, I, it's going to be huge. Now, you know how his parents reacted uh, to that. They had the one son over here who's like the golden child, go be the banker, and he went off and did that. The other thing I, I really liked about Steve Case, and we saw this with a number of people, but he's very, very passionate with them. If I could write one more chapter in this book, 
it would be that for the most part, when these people achieve this kind of wealth, this group of people, they feel there's an obligation to do something with that to better the world. And philanthropy is a really important thing for Steve in terms of especially education, which he's passionate about. But most of these people have foundations. They've taken the Buffett Pledge in terms of giving away the vast majority of their wealth. And I think there's been a shift that we've seen in terms of how they view philanthropy. That it's not about just getting your name on a building. It's actually about having an impact and doing something that, and that's why you see the Gates Foundation doing some really fascinating kinds of things. So he was, so I, I could take you through the whole cycle of of Steve Case that he's going all the way to the end and he's still a creative guy, spends time at the White House looking at how education could be repositioned, doing his philanthropy, investing. He was a you know, major investor in several startups that have also been very, very successful after that. So he happened to be um, my favorite. All right, and we are just about out of time here. Okay. So thank you very much, Mitch, for giving a round of applause for Mitch here. Thank you all. And thank you very much all for coming. If you'd like to uh, give us some feedback, there's a link up there. You get another chance to win the uh, $10 gift card. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for your time. Good job. That was great. Was it? Yeah. yeah it was good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah.